Hello. This is awesome. Sorry. The happy people. Oh, <laughs> so far. I'm, 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 I'm an overjoyed people. I know that's not correct. But um, when I was invited to get to interview Tristan, I was like, yeah, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll do that 10 times, 20 times. And so I, I'm perhaps the happiest person here. Um, sorry, Tristan, I had a moment. Um, <laughs> I, I've been taking notes. You know, I've been taking notes about what do I want to ask Tristan on stage? Um, I had a moment listening to Courtney and her introduction. That was a nice moment because uh, the button, which button did you pick? Rams. Oh, excellent. Dita Rams. Uh, I picked Muriel Cooper, who was the person that I met in 1987, who told me to leave MIT and go to art school. <laughs> there she That's was awesome. on the table. That's awesome. I was like, whoa, Muriel, what you doing here? <laughs> Good um, karma. <laughs> and I was thinking about Carbon 5 and Courtney being a creative and technical lead, the combo. See that combo, the Reese's peanut butter chocolate, <laughs> you know? Peanut butter, rare combination. <laughs> and when you think of Tristan, or when I think of Tristan, I think of him as someone who has so many parts that are integrating together to form a different kind of founder of a different kind of company. And that's exciting. Thank you. Uh, and Tristan, I've been like reading up about you in different ways, all <laughs> positive, of course. But uh, if there's one thing I learned uh, from my fine time at Kleiner Perkins was the idea of a lightning round to start off. Okay. And I didn't actually give you the questions beforehand to prepare you, but, <laughs> so I apologize in advance. <laughs> but um, I, was like, I was like, what, what kind of lightning round could I do? With? So I'm going to ask Tristan six questions just to give him a six? easy, easy, Jesus easy Christ. ones. All right. And you just have to answer with the one that you think you know, is you. Okay. Snap it, ready? And I call this starting with food and getting nerdy. Okay. <laughs> First question. Blueberries or strawberries? Strawberries. Oh, fast. Easy. Okay, there we go. Uh, Soylent 8-ounce or Starbucks venti latte? Ooh. Ah, uh, okay. Go <laughs> tough. I know that was tough for different reasons. Okay. <laughs> okay. Next one. Original iPhone or iPhone six? Original iPhone every day. Like. Oh yeah, yeah. That iPhone six falls out of your hand all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Designed to break your glass. Okay. Next one. Iron Man or Black Panther? Black Panther. Right. That's cool. Yeah. Cadillac or BMW? BMW. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's easy. That was fast. That's closed source or open source? That's unfair. I know. I know. <laughs> I know. That, that is unfair. We'll leave it at that. So that's a little bit of Tristan. So to start with food and getting nerdy. Now we're going to go into how... Um, I noticed how... Well, I'm sure all of you, when you had that moment when you got to talk to each other... And there was that sort of Seinfeld moment of no friendship for you. You know, you have to stop. <laughs> but you had like, oh my gosh, I, I like this person. I want to hang out and talk with them, you know. And it's because you find different things that are kind of similar, not the same. And it feels really good. And I know that when I met Tristan, I just went, wow, like, oh, interesting background. And as I began to dig in closer to your background, I thought, oh, I, I feel some similarities. And so I pulled out some similarities uh, between me and Tristan. Uh, <laughs> first one is we both have business school in us. You have the better business school in you, of course. Uh -huh. uh, but a lot of people come up to me and always say, is business school really worth it, John? Mm -hmm. Is it really worth it? Should I get an MBA? And is it worth it? What do you say to them? 100 percent. You know, first of all, it costs like two hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> and I, I tell a lot of folks I would have paid three X, uh, you know, for the education and the opportunity that I've gotten. I'm very thankful and blessed uh, by the opportunity. Uh, so there are a couple of reasons why I think business school is uniquely beneficial for me. Number one, it taught me that Silicon Valley existed. Right. 
you know, prior to my uh, applying to business school, I worked on Wall Street. I had no idea about this place. I thought uh, Silicon Valley was a place where semiconductors got made. They got better over time. That's all I, I knew about this place. I hated Wall Street so much uh, that I said I want to get as far away from this place as literally and figuratively as possible. Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean, there's a school called Stanford. They're well known for entrepreneurship. Let me apply and let me try it. Uh, fortunately, I got in. And the thing that is unique about Stanford, and I can't speak about any other business school, so you have to take what I say with a grain of salt. The thing that's so beautiful about Stanford Business School is not Stanford Business School, it's Stanford Law School, Stanford Medical School, Stanford Design School, among other things, and they're all across the street from one another. Uh, so I had the beautiful, amazing opportunity to just literally walk across the street and speak to folks who were the best in their field uh, in every single category. And it really taught me about the power of collaboration uh, to actually affect major change in the world. And it made me understand why Stanford specifically uh, was so special. Uh, and secondly, uh, you know, I have to give Stanford Business School some credit here. <laughs> uh, it fundamentally changed my life. I think business school in general, a lot of folks, particularly in Silicon Valley and tech, will say, no, you don't need business school. And I think that that's BS uh, for a multitude of reasons. But most particularly, uh, what I got to learn is what other folks did wrong, <laughs> right? Uh, so that I knew that if I had to go through those same experiences, I wouldn't have to go through those same things, right? And I think that was worth every single penny that I could have mustered. And when you think of, uh, you work with a lot of people, like engineers, creatives, et cetera. When you have an engineer come up to you and say, should I go to business school, what do you tell them? Uh, so uh, my answer is the same for anyone else. You got to know exactly what you want to get out of business school, right? If you're asking that question, you probably shouldn't go. <laughs> right? Uh, I knew exactly what I wanted to get out of business school. I knew I wanted to start a company afterwards. I knew I w didn't want to make the same mistakes that other folks and luminaries made. Right? I knew I wanted to learn. I, also, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Right? Uh, so what business school afforded me was that opportunity and time to really figure out the thing that was meaningful to me outside of just entrepreneurship itself. Like what tangibly did I actually want to execute against? And it was for that reason, the best decision that I ever made. And I ensure uh, that anyone who actually inquires about business schools knows definitively what they want to do, because $200,000 is a lot of money to pay for something that you don't know what you want to get out of it. Right? When you think about it, I'm going to at least hover here, because it's a question that I get asked the most often is business school. I'm so glad you, get, you have all the, the right answers for it. <laughs> um, so I'm like a creative person, and like, Whenever I go to a meeting, I don't understand what the business people are talking about. <laughs> yeah. And I'm thinking I'm going to business school. What do you say to that person? Well, the first thing is a lot of the business people don't know what the business people are talking about, right? <laughs> so, like, so that's number one. I think we just got to kind of level set and table stakes. Um, but, you know, the best business schools are the ones that are incredibly diverse. They're going to get the business folks. They're going to get the creatives. They're going to get the politicians. They're going to get the not-for-profit folks, mm -hmm. right? And again, when you combine it with the other schools that are on campus, that's what creates the greatest opportunity for you, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so what I say for folks is, you know, like you got to understand what you want to get out of it, right? Mm -hmm. Um, because certain schools are unique for certain things, right? If you know you want to stay in finance, there are certain schools for that. If you know you want to be entrepreneurial, there are certain schools for that, right? Um, so just really understand that and kind of pick, pick, pick right. Wow, got the final answer there. <laughs> yeah. uh, so know what you want, okay? And don't forget that you're going for the ecosystem around it. Yeah, totally. And I think even more important, and I speak to a lot of folks that think they know what they want to do, but they really don't, right? Uh, and I kind of have rationalized this over the past few years. Up until business school, um, you know, I would kind of live my life according to what other folks believed that I should do, right? You know, I wanted to work on Wall Street because it seemed like the right thing to do, and folks would push me in that direction. You know, I wanted to be an athlete because it felt like the right thing to do. Um, but it wasn't until kind of after I kind of went through the business school program and knew I wanted to start my own company, et cetera, that I had to think, you know what? I can't care what people think about me, right, and the things that I want to do. I need to fundamentally do the things that I fundamentally believe need to be built, uh, drive my own personal ambition, and not have any regard for what folks believe that I should be doing, right? Uh, so that was, like, for me, the most freeing realization, and I think the folks that succeed in business school are the folks that come to that realization a lot sooner than later. That, that keyword, people who succeed in business school, I just want to pause on for a second. Yes, Stanford Business School is awesome, and all these schools are awesome, but all of them don't succeed. Mm -hmm. And when you forget that, and you notice that we're with someone who went through that program and made the investment, 
and is one of the few that are succeeding is phenomenal. Can we just give some applause for Tristan? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. He, ma he makes it look so easy, but uh, not easy at all. Okay, finally know how to answer that question. Second question, so, so second thing we, we, we share in common is we were both in Helena Price's Techies Project. Yes. I was, I was, I, when it came out, I was like, oh, look, there's Tristan there, too. <laughs> like, oh, we did it together. Well, we weren't there together, but it all happened that way. Oh, when she reached out to you, why did you decide to be a part of it? Yeah, yeah. So for folks who aren't familiar with it, the Techies Project uh, is a really fantastic um, you know, project led by Helena. She's a fantastic photographer. Uh, she wanted to profile a lot of the kind of great folks of color in technology and tell their stories in a unique and authentic way. Uh, you know, whenever that happens, I get very excited about it, right? Because I think that there's an important story to tell there. Right? When you consider at least folks of color, I fundamentally believe this to be true, particularly in the context of my own personal company. You know, folks of color, at least in this country, are kind of the cultural arbiters for the entire globe, right? If you think about all culture, I fundamentally believe all global culture is led by American culture, which is led by black, Latino, Asian culture in the US, right? Um, so really to understand how the producers, right, within this demographic group that happens to be the greatest consumer demographic group in the world, like understanding how they're producing, understanding how they're fundamentally changing the world and how we look at it, it's incredibly important, right? Uh, and when you kind of consider uh, kind of the power shift happening in this country, a lot of which kind of is translating from like DC uh, to Silicon Valley and having these arbiters of culture who are producers kind of building great things for the world, you know, those are stories that deserve to be told. Those are stories that deserve to be evangelized, that are the stories that really deserve um, kind of everyone's reading. Uh, so, you know, whenever I get that opportunity to kind of participate, uh, I drop everything else uh, and ensure that I'm being supportive. I mean, when I saw you, I, I was like, oh, he's so busy, but he, <laughs> he's in there. And, and it was so unique because it really represents uh, every type of person out there. Like, I think I was in there because I'm like an older person. <laughs> uh, but I think that, you know, whether representing the LGBTQ population, uh, more women engineers, it was older, you know, it was just this wonderful, I was like, wow, this is America. Yeah, it's, it's incredibly important. And at least when I fundamentally kind of think about our production and our influence, et cetera, you know, the reason why it's so important that these stories get told is because I fundamentally believe that the folks that are creating, folks of color that are creating here, uh, if we continue to support them, it's the greatest economic opportunity of my lifetime, whether that be for-profit or not-for-profit and America's competitiveness, right? So whatever I can do for a country that believes so deeply in its hope and, like, opportunity, uh, if we're not evangelizing that, then we're doing a disservice to this country. And I wasn't asked to advertise this project, by the way. <laughs> uh, it's just something I read all the time because there's so many interviews in there and like, huh, I never saw the world that way or... Uh, so if you have a moment, anytime, or, you know, we have all these moments where we're like standing in line waiting for something, um, Techies Project, read a different interview by a different person, and you'll start thinking differently because our whole world is bombarded with this image of Silicon Valley, yeah. with that HBO TV show that's funny and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah. But you start thinking maybe that's the right way, even though you make fun of it. So yeah. that, that, it's a, that, that's a big bias change for Techies Project. So it's evergreen. Ah, third thing we have in common, venture capital world. Oh, you were in a venture capital, <laughs> you were hanging out in VC. Indeed. Wow. Yeah. Tell us about what that's like, yeah, Kristen. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, again, I, I, gosh, I'm so incredibly blessed and fortunate to, to have a lot of the opportunities that I've had. So, uh, you know, I worked at a company called Foursquare. I worked there for about three years. You know, I was one of the earliest employees. I got to, you know, build the type of company that I always wanted to build, right? A company that folks were inspired to support uh, that was fundamentally changing the world. And at the end of the three years, I felt there were other ambitious things that needed building, right? Uh, and I wanted the opportunity to do that. Uh, so one of our board members, Ben Harwood, said, come join us uh, for nine months, uh, figure out what you want to do, and we'll pay you to do it. Uh, to this day, don't tell my team, it's one of the best jobs I've ever had because I got paid to think of ideas every day, which is actually crazy. Your team's when you right think here, about, watch I'm out. I'm sorry, yeah, it's <laughs> like I can't hide from it. Um, so so the, the story goes, I like to say, you know, I spent all nine months there because they were paying me to do it, uh, but I spent the first seven months of my time there wasting their time, right? So what does that mean? 
Uh, you know, I was trying to chase the most ambitious thing that I could ever build. Like I wanted to build a bank, fix childhood obesity, that sort of thing. Uh, and it was the kind of most transformative, one of the most transformative periods of my life because I realized uh, in that, that if I'm going to dedicate the next like 20, 30, 40 years of my life to anything, I wanted to fundamentally feel like I was the best person in the world to solve that thing, right? And it took my having to be at a venture capital firm to really understand that. You know, a lot of venture capitalists, you know, they'll see hundreds or thousands of pitches every single year. And one thing that you see is lots of sameness, right? There are a lot of folks just chasing the same things. And the best venture capitalists, and Dries and Howard's being one of them, you start to realize that the best venture capitalists are the ones that chase the things that are completely counterintuitive, right? The bad ideas, right? Uh, you know, if you invest in the bad ideas, right, those tend to be the good ones. Um, so, you know, the examples that we always give are like the Airbnbs and the Ubers, et cetera. Like, who would have ever thought that, you know, strangers uh, would have rented out their own rooms to other strangers and charged money for that? Like, that is completely crazy, and that's a terrible idea as of, like, 10 years ago, <laughs> right? Uh, and these guys have created, like, $30 billion of value in that bad idea. So it took my having been there for about nine months to realize that I probably should be chasing the bad ideas, Right? Uh, and for a while, I always tried to chase the good ones. Uh, and the, the challenge in that is if everyone else chases the good ideas, there's not much value to create, right? Uh, so it was, again, transformative in so much as my really believing and understanding that if I wanted to kind of create the step function change and like affect uh, kind of society in ways that are incredibly ambitious, chase the bad ideas. I want to hover here for a second because I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm recently out of the venture capital world into a new world. Congratulations. It's very interesting. <laughs> um, and, and one thing that strikes me is I remember when I entered it, people kept saying to me, oh, John, you don't want to hang out with venture capitalists. They're bad people. <laughs> and I would tell them, well, I know a lot of bad artists. <laughs> you just don't want to be near them. They're dangerous. Yeah. So because I found there are good venture capitalists. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about your experiences with working with good venture capitalists and what they taught you before you were going to jump in to make a company? What did you notice about what the good venture capitalists were doing with their entrepreneurs? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's interesting that you actually worded it that way. I mean, look, I mean, there's nothing special about there being venture capitalists, right? Like, they're just good people, right? And the one thing that I was very thankful for, at least in my time there, is that I had folks that were willing to tell me the truth. You know, prior to my going there, you know, I had a lot of venture capitalists that would say, you know, Tristan, you can start a sock company. I'm in. I'm like, just tell me, right? Like, I'll give you all this, like, all this money to do it. And it's fascinating, once I finally gave them the idea that I wanted to do, they were like, yeah, I don't know about that, <laughs> right? Like, I'm not sure I support that as much. Uh, and it was an incredible eye-opening experience where I actually learned um, that it's not necessarily the case that the folks on the other side of the table are smarter than I am, right? Perhaps they just don't have the context that I have, right? And there's a beauty and like an importance in that. Right, so when I think about it, I don't think about title of venture capitalist when I think about folks on the other side of the table. I think, are you willing to acquire the context that I have to understand what we're actually building? Right? Mm. Uh, and fortunately, at Andreessen and Horowitz, I have folks that are willing to tell me that truth and acquire that context. Mm. I think what's important lesson that I take away from just listening to you in these initial minutes, and I love how we have an old-fashioned counter. There's no iPad. <laughs> an actual <laughs> binder <laughs> with numbers on it. Crazy. <laughs> um, but when you think about biases, unconscious mm -hmm. bias, I think there's unconscious bias towards people with money. Yeah. Like, oh, they're all bad people. I saw it on mm -hmm. TV. Mm -hmm. They were doing bad things. Mm -hmm. And I think that for entrepreneurs, you can't help but have that bias of having seen it on TV. Yeah. So at what point did you, were you able to get over your own bias against the money people to realize that they were actually going to be partners with you? So first of all, I have no bias against money people because I want to be a money person. Right? <laughs> like, like I, you know, I've, I've had every desire in the world, at least given my background, I've come from pretty humble beginnings. And, you know, I have every goal in the world to be as wealthy as possible as quickly as possible so I can affect the change that I seek, right? Uh, so that's first and foremost. I don't have any problems with wealthy folks, right? I have problems with wealthy folks that are, aren't willing to acquire the context to really understand how to change um, the world, I should say. Um, so at least for me, right, like it just really boiled down to, at least in Silicon Valley, there are 
rich folks that don't care, and there are rich folks who do care. Mm. Uh, so at least, uh, at least in the 32 years of my life, you know, I've learned a lot about myself, right? Like what's important, how I prioritize the things that are important to me, et cetera. Uh, and over the past year or so, you know, I've had a, a few transformative experiences to speak to some of this. I live my life very simply now. I have six values that matter, right? Personal values that also translate to my company, but they're personal values of mine. It's courage, inspiration, respect, judgment, wellness, and loyalty, right? Full stop. Every single decision I make, uh, all the folks that I hang out with, the folks I seek advice from are folks that share those values, right? Um, so for me, it's a bit of a moot kind of like point in question because I only try to involve myself with folks that share my personal values. That doesn't necessarily mean that we share the same views of the world, right? But we have the same core personal values, and I try to not make time for anything else. Wow, he's yeah. optimized. I, I, <laughs> I've hung out with so many bad people in my life by not having that six checklist. I'm like, hi, let's be friends. Oh, that hurt, you know? Okay, maybe I, I could have like done more in my life. Um, so when we talk about, but I want to hover again on venture, cause I, venture capital, because one thing that I, I didn't realize is how useful venture capital money is. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> I mean, here you are, you're making your company and you're just so busy and you can, the margins are like this and the most you can grow is this and the most you can dream is like this and, and venture capital money changes that game. Yeah. Um, well, first and foremost, quite literally, it does. <laughs> um, in order to start the company that I you know, started, it would take $2 million to start it, right? Like, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You just got to raise the money in order to get folks to know that you exist, right? So that's number one. Um, and then I'd say number two, it's both a gift and a curse, right? Because the minute you take money, uh, there's a growth imperative that they have that might be completely different from your own, right? You know, I have every ambition in the world to build a company that's still around 150 years from now, right? You compare that with a lot of venture capitalists that need to see a 10x return inside of 10 years. Like, how do you actually kind of combat that? So this goes back to the kind of personal values, right? Like, I need to make sure that every single investor, board member, employee, et cetera, shares my own personal values to that ambition for 150 years from now. Otherwise, we're duped, right? So venture capital is the greatest thing in the world and the worst thing in the world, depending on who you work with. That who you work with and... Tristan's six checklist. I wish I wrote it down, but I hope <laughs> someone wrote that down. Good combination of things. Okay, very effective. Now we're going to go into the, the topic of this, this gathering here, design, because I know you're passionate about very it. Much so. Your products, like, they're, they're designed. <laughs> they feel like design. They aspire to even more design. As I, as I watch you on Twitter, and I just found out that Tristan, that's actually him on Twitter like firing off tweets. All the time, I apologize. I yeah. thought he had like an extra person <laughs> or maybe Definitely a robotic not. Tristan next to him doing Definitely this or something. Not. But you're talking to the entire planet <laughs> and they're saying to you things like, oh my gosh, I love Bevel, I love this. And you're like, yeah, I told you. I was like, how did he do that? Um, but you're really connected to your customers and you can feel how excited they are that you're designing something for their unique needs yeah. that was overlooked. Sure. So first of all, when people t tell you your design is really excellent, what is that design? Like, wh what exactly is design in your world, in your company's view? Yeah, um, that's an interesting question. Um, you're wearing Adidas Rom's bag, I am. so. You know, the, the reason why it's like so funny and ironic, because like, you know, I was thinking about this on the way here because uh, you had tweeted out today some like sample questions. So I'm like looking at his Twitter account. I'm like, oh, what should I prepare? And one of them was like, you know, how do we define design or something? And I the irony, at the bottom. <laughs> yeah, the <laughs> irony is like I was thinking about my coffee table. And you know, how everyone has coffee table books and that sort of thing. And I just ordered one two weeks ago. It just got delivered a couple days ago. And uh, the one that sits at the top of my coffee table. The title is <laughs> Defining Design. And I'm like, damn, I should have read it before I started this one. <laughs> and I think you wrote the forward or something like that, didn't you? Yeah, so like, it's absolutely hilarious. <laughs> but anyway, so, so, so here's, here's, here's how I think about it. Um, I think about this quite a bit, and I, I hope I don't butcher it, but it matters to me. Uh, when I think about design, I think about something very simply. I think about 
kind of like beautiful, empathetic, like solutions to a problem, right? And I think about like my own kind of personal inspirations. Um, funny enough, you, I'd never told you I read your like simplicity book, and that actually inspired me quite oh. a bit about four or five years ago. Anyway, it's a very tearful moment. Um, <laughs> my hero. Um, <laughs> So uh, the thing about beautiful, empathetic design, I, I think about a lot about my own kind of inspirations, right? And this goes all the way back to like Dutch painters, like the Vermeers, the Rembrandts, et cetera. And even more recently, um, you know, I get really excited about like photography, street photography, right? So you have the Bruce Davidsons, the Gordon Parks, right? The Vivian Myers of the world. And these are folks in different centuries, different genres of art and design, et cetera. And there's one thing that kind of like binds them all together, right? And it's like they're finding beauty in like mundane things, right? Like the mundane is incredibly beautiful. And it's not only that they find beauty in that mundane, right? They give it dignity, right? And hope and inspiration. Mm. Um, so we think about at least Bevel, which is the first flagship brand un under Walker and Company. So for folks who aren't aware, uh, you know, Bevel is the first and only shaving system designed specifically for folks with um, coarse curly hair prone to irritation, razor bumps, et cetera. We've eradicated the issue. The problem has been around for around 100 years, right? Up to 80% of black men and women have it, 30% of everyone else. So you take something as mundane and boring as shaving, <laughs> right? And kind of we look at the stories that we get from our customers, right? The single mom who's teaching her son how to shave, right? That's my story. You know, the gentleman in the army that has to shave every day uh, with inferior products, prone to razor bumps, and affects his performance in the field. The gentleman working on Wall Street that gets ridiculed for donning a beard to work out of fear of using some of the mass market products that exist. That's a very mundane story. And what Bevel's allowed and provided um, is dignity uh, in, in our own kind of personal design. That's not only aesthetic, right? It's experiential, right? We want to folks feel we want our folks to feel like first-class citizens in a world where at retail they feel second-class, right? So everything from not only the note that folks get from us every single time they purchase that's handwritten by me, uh, to the two and a half seconds it takes to lift the top of like lid from the bottom, right, and building that anticipation for what's beneath. Like we're very thoughtful about that stuff. Um, and you know, I, I can get really verbose about this stuff because I, I care quite a bit. Um, you know, Johnny Ive at, at Apple said something that stuck with me for a while at a conference a couple years ago. He said, you know, consumers can discern care for a product uh, as much as they can discern carelessness for it, right? And it's like such a uniquely interesting kind of statement to make, right? Like folks notice the two and a half second lift. Like folks notice the handwritten penmanship, right? Like, folks notice the fact that we'll do, like, video one-on-one -on -one interviews with folks when they shave, knowing it doesn't scale, but knowing that it's important, right? So the reason, I think, uh, we have so many customers that love us from, you know, in our design and our experience, et cetera, uh, because we see that beauty in the mundane, and we're willing to tell those stories in a way that gives it dignity, right? And I'm, I'm very thankful for the opportunity to do it, uh, and, and hopefully, you know, it continues in that stead. You know... You made me think just now about design, and I'm I'm having my own sort of moment now by uh, by just joining Automatic, and I'm a, I'm I've been happiness engineering, yeah, which is our word for customer support, yeah. but it's more I mean it's like amazing, I, I I and and just working with the happiness engineers, I realize how much happiness they bring yeah. uh, to people making this site or whatever, changing this whatever, and I, I grew up in a tofu store in Seattle, and we had customers. My mom, they would come, for, not for the tofu, for my mom, because she was awesome. <laughs> yeah. um, but that customer support linkage, we lose in companies mm -hmm. and engagement. Mm -hmm. And you made me think about how part of your design ethos or philosophy is, is likely fueled by being on Twitter mm -hmm. and hearing the good with the bad. I'll see you react to the bad with the same energy that you do with the good. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, you can feel their dignity changing by your products, mm -hmm. and you want to fight harder. Of course, 100%. It's like we're in a world that is growing more devoid of empathy. And that sucks, right? It shouldn't be that way. <laughs> right? 
Uh, so I want to ensure that everything that we do, every single interaction we have with our customers, every single interaction we have with potential customers, every single interaction we have with canceled customers, right, really brings empathy to the forefront, right? Uh, and if we don't do that, we fail. It, it's really that simple. I remember when we were in Aspen for a design thing together, and I was really happy when you were trying to help the, the, the audience understand that design isn't just about pretty things. Mm -hmm. It impacts business, mm -hmm. impacts your business. Mm -hmm. Can you describe that further? Yeah, no, totally. Uh, so it's interesting. So I kind of think about this idea of uh, you know, beautiful, empathetic solutions. Like what does that mean in the world where you build companies, right? So like what's a potential problem uh, that needs a solution, right? So one thing that we talk a lot about is even just the diversity of our company, right? Uh, you know, we have a company in Silicon Valley, which is a bit weird that like we're majority minority, majority woman, the majority of my leadership is women of color. Like that's different and unique and weird. <laughs> uh, it shouldn't be, but it is, right? Um, and you know, we always knew a couple of things. Number one, um, in order to build a company that matters in the space that we're in, um, the diversity of our employee base needed to reflect the diversity of our consumer base, right? So number one, let's solve that problem by ensuring that happens. So how do you do that, right? Um, so you know, I just came from um, uh, another talk at another technology company, and they asked me similar questions around diversity and inclusion and how it's possible that like you guys are majority minority and we're not. And I'm like, it's very easy. <laughs> like it's very very simple, um, and we kind of approach this with empathy, very much in the same way. It all starts with values, 100%, right? Uh, and you know, a few folks from my team are here now, and perhaps they can kind of tell you, anytime anyone, anyone says kind of the words culture fit, I, I get disgusted, and I kind of want to throw up, <laughs> right? Um, the reason is, no one ever defines it, right? Like, when you say culture fit, it's like, oh, this person made me laugh. I played golf with this person. That's a very selfish thing, right? There's no empathy and selflessness in that. Right? Uh, so two weeks even before I found my, or got my first round of funding, I wrote down those six values, the courage all the way to loyalty. Right? And I defined every single one. Why is that important? Now when we interview folks, we'll ask leading questions to get at one's inspiration, courage, respect, judgment, wellness, loyalty. Right? Uh, when we give your semi-annual annual reviews, you're rated against your goal attainment, but also your adherence to the values that we have at the company. You know, why does that matter? Because we operate the same way when I'm in the room or outside of it. Right? And that's selfless, at least in my opinion. So we've taken a very big problem that a lot of folks have, and we've solved it through empathy. And notice something about every single one of those values. Right? It's not male. It's not female. It's not black, Latino, Asian. It's not old. It's not young. And you look at a lot of the other companies that exist out there, it's like biased action, <laughs> right? Uh, we're going to kill our competitors, right? Like, like, no, that doesn't resonate with everyone. Like, everyone wants to be courageous. Everyone wants to be inspired, right? Folks want to kind of be treated with respect. Uh, and I think in our definition of those things, uh, by definition, we are practicing our own empathy. Uh, so it should be no different in our product development as it is in our hiring. This is like one of those desserts where you just want to enjoy it more. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to, like, mess it up or anything, you know? Um, because uh, this, and when you said the word culture fit, that word to me also signals just e the easy feeling you can have, but you just don't have to justify yeah, it. It's lazy. And then it begins to propagate a notion that, well, they're like us and they're not like us and we're better than them. Yeah. And it's just so vague. Yeah, very much so. I hate it. <laughs> yeah. I hate it so much. Ooh, I like, I'm going to hate that word from now on. Though. Good. Um, <laughs> watch out. Um, okay, so uh, so why is it, well, at least, uh, at least I've seen this, maybe you've seen it differently, but why is it that most creative people out there, creative people, traditionally trained creative people, make a face when they hear the word business? Hmm. Like, <sighs> business, you know, mm. you know. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure if you've ever seen that face before, yeah. but I've seen it a lot. Do you ever see that face at all? Or maybe in your past lives or no? Um, you know, well, at least like for me, I, I see a hell of a lot less of it. I actually wanted to ask you that same question, but I'll answer first and I'll put yeah, it back on Yeah, we can you. do that. <laughs> right? Um, so I think the reason why I haven't seen as much of it is because like, 
I don't think I'm a business person. I think I'm a creative person that appreciates business, <laughs> right? Um, like, I think there's too much us versus them, uh, and there are plenty of folks in the world that can appreciate both, right? Like folks like you, like folks like me, et cetera. Uh, and I think the more and more we can appreciate um, the fact that it doesn't have to be us versus them, like that opens up opportunities for more empathy, more creation, more brilliance, more genius, <laughs> right? Um, so I, I've never really had to deal with that as much because I try to speak my language as creatives do, right? Mm. Uh, and again, by definition, that is empathy, right? Mm. Um, so I, I never understood why folks kind of cringe and make that face um, because to me, they're one and the same. Like you, it's hard to be a creative um, without an appreciation for business because you're gonna create something that no one could benefit from. <laughs> right? The definition of being a creative is creating value, right? But then someone needs to extract that value, right, to the benefit of others. You know, one of the best lessons that I learned, um, not necessarily about this, but it's tangentially related. You know, I was 20 years old and I was working on Wall Street, hating my life, <laughs> right? And there's one gentleman, his name was Bill Lighton. He was a managing director on Wall Street, um, one of the most successful, like, black managing directors ever. He said, Tristan, sit down. And I was like, all right, great, thank you. Um, and he said, I have the you know, formula for life, right? And I was like, all right, awesome, hit me with it. And he said, you know, Tristan, you want to spend the first third of your life learning, the second third of your life earning, and the last third returning, right? And I thought that was unique. You know, here's a guy who left Yale when he was 20. He started to work on Wall Street. The day he turned 40, he quit. He was super successful, didn't have to, making millions of dollars. And then now he's doing straight up philanthropy. The reason he ordered it in that way, he said too many people try and put the return thing before the earn thing, which prevents them from scaling their return and impact, right? And it was it's just an interesting thing for me to hear. So when I kind of thought about my own career, it's like, how do I shorten the earn thing uh, so I can maximize the return thing? And if you're a creative that fundamentally wants to change the world, uh, if you kind of poo-poo business, right, like you're going to minimize your impact. Uh, and I never wanted to fall victim to that. Mm. Well, you know, most people don't, uh, you know, it's funny, just like yesterday, I was talking with someone about a hypercard, and they're like, hypercard? I'm like, oh my gosh, you don't know hypercard. <laughs> uh, and, there, and I realized that many people don't remember there was a time when Apple sucked. <laughs> it was like, Apple? Oh, give me a break. He you know, said like, I <laughs> uh, there was that time where uh, Apple, <laughs> you know, Apple. <laughs> no, no. Uh, and, and the reason why it's important is that because Steve Jobs version one kept making these super over designed objects that cost too much yeah. that nobody would want to pay for because they could buy something that was 10 times faster and yeah. half the price. So, what a dumb idea. Yeah. Until. He brought in Tim Cook, who brought the whole logistics science to reduce the actual cost of an Apple design thing to be able to have huge margins to invest in mm -hmm. design. Mm -hmm. So that is business thinking. Well, I mean, it's just as beautiful as the, the aesthetic part of it, right? Like the fact that you can make something so beautiful at half the cost, like why isn't that beautiful? That's the sexiest thing on the planet to me, right? Like, <laughs> that is awesome. Like, by making it cheaper, you make it more accessible. Uh, that means that more folks can benefit from it. You scale your return and your impact, right? So sure, like, creatives can poo-poo business, and they can affect five people. I want to affect five billion. And, and for anyone who is dealing with this dilemma in their own life, or a friend dealing with that dilemma, let us remember that Tristan is wearing a Dita Roms pin. <laughs> Dita Roms known worldwide for being the sort of iconoclastic designer of appliances and things like that, and sort of like amazing, all tied to Bauhaus style thinking. And Bauhaus is the temple of design where pure thinking was allowed, but forgetting that the Bauhaus was a project of the German economic ministry as a way to compete nationally against the British, who in the 1800s formed a department of art and science to fund something called the Royal College of Art and the V&A Museum to make better wares in Britain because they were jealous of the French. <laughs> because in the 1700s, the 
the French were killing it. <laughs> That's awesome. But it was all an economic play. <laughs> but somehow it was forgotten that that economic play yeah, is important. It matters. It matters in a very big way. And uh, all that I care about now is like, how do we just scale this impact in a way that it's truly significant? So, okay. So, what tech company comes to mind when you think about design? In 2016, you think, oh, yeah, that, that, that tech company. Um, only one? Yeah. Hmm. Oh, 25 minutes? I still have 25 minutes to figure this out. <laughs> <laughs> um, hmm. Twitter. Hmm. Why? The, the thing I appreciate so much about Jack Dorsey is that he's completely uncompromising. Um, he knows what he believes the platform should be. Uh, it's, it, there's power in the platform of communication. He wants to extract all the superfluous for the sake of its core benefit and connecting the world together in a unique way. Uh, he doesn't let the business interest kind of um, affect uh, that, um, that line of thinking, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, it's kind of one of the few technology companies, and like and you look at Apple now without Steve Jobs, Tim Cook running it, like it feels like a business as opposed to you know, a company with real immense soul to it and real continued empathy. Mm. Uh, at least when I think about Twitter, uh, at least as far as um, kind of Jack Dorsey's being at the helm, it still feels like there's soul, right? Like he's empathetic to the needs of its users. Uh, and there's something about that soul that just speaks to me, right? Like, you know, any company that designs to that soul and that empathy and the unique kind of latent needs of its consumers, right, uh, is a pretty special thing. Uh, and it's incredibly simplistic. You know, one thing I tell a lot of folks, and it's probably the most taboo thing <laughs> to say, particularly out here on the planet, you know, I, I think Twitter is one of those services that will never die, right? Even if it doesn't succeed as a business, it is so valuable to certainly to me and other folks, that it will become the w most well-funded 501c3 like on the planet, <laughs> right, <laughs> if it did. And I, I'm not sure I can say that about um, very many other companies. And the second thing, I think about this in the context of my own company. You know, I think a lot about this. I'm 32 years old now. And I can't say um, matter-of-factly that I've had companies I was proud to support. There are a lot of great companies with great products, right? Apple, Tesla, all that stuff, right? Um, but I can't say I'm proud to support those companies, right? And I feel like, you know, I, I kind of make this joke, and it's a very serious statement, but I kind of say it all the time. When my mom was growing up, you know, she had, like, Soul Train, right? And, like, Soft Sheen Carson and, like, stuff like that, where she's fundamentally proud to support those things. And when I look at this generation and future generations, at least in the context of Walker and Company, can we be that brand uh, that folks are proud to support? I think the closest uh, kind of company that kind of speaks to some of that, uh, to, that I'm actually fundamentally proud to support is Twitter. I'm just laughing to myself because you mentioned, we mentioned your mom and Soul Train. <laughs> I, I, I mean, you know, my mom is like 82 years old and she thought that buying Franklin Mint things was going to make a money someday. That's awesome. <laughs> There's all these things from Franklin Mint, and she said, John, That's we awesome. can sell these, That's and awesome. Mom, they're not worth anything. <laughs> but I bring it up because that was a really good business. Yeah, totally. But it was a soulless business. Yes. Yeah, totally. Because I did see you make the business face. Yeah. Business. <laughs> Uh, then you added, was, but soulful. Mm -hmm. So uh, one thing I'm pulling away from how we describe a great business, just listening to you, is that you want a business with a soul. Yeah. Like, not this one that th tricked my mother into thinking that this is how she was going to make up her retirement. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, she just thought it would, and it looked pretty good at the time. Yeah, yeah. But then you added the word empathy, mm -hmm. and I think you mentioned Twitter. I think... Personally, the reason why you like Twitter is because you can stay in touch with your customers. It's a real-time way to keep the empathy in you alive. Well, I, I love Twitter before I even had customers, right? Before I even had a company, right? So the other word that I'd added in there is authenticity. I t yeah. Like, one thing that folks don't know about me, I mean, they see me on Twitter all the time, and they think I'm the most extroverted person on the planet. I'm incredibly introverted, like, incredibly introverted. What Twitter has allowed me to do is to scale my, like, voice to a lot more people, whether it's customers or not, right? 
and it allows me to continue to be my best self as long as I continue to kind of articulate the values that matter to me. Uh, and I can reach anyone, <laughs> right? And I can touch anyone. And I could be authentic in that regard without necessarily having to kind of travel and be at a networking event, drinking with these groups of folks that I may or may not like, et cetera, right? <laughs> um, but like that's, that's to give someone like me voice, uh, particularly when uh, one might think that introversion is a, um, is a flaw, <laughs> right? Like Twitter showed me that it doesn't have to be. Uh, and that's why I'm so thankful for it. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask a Facebook question, but that would get controversial. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have a quite another different question. Quick change of subject, it could get dangerous. Um, so is, is Walker & Co. a tech company? Um, well, we're a health and beauty products company, uh, and we leverage tech to completely disrupt the way people think about health and beauty products. Um, you know, one question I get a lot is like, Tristan, why would you leave tech? right? All the time, at least once a week, I get that. Uh, and, you know, I, I started to kind of refine my answer best um, after kind of one particular event that happened to me a few months ago. You know, I was at this like USA Today event and uh, at, on a panel and afterwards, I had a gentleman walk up to me uh, and he said, Tristan, um, you know, why'd you leave tech? And what happened next was funny, um, but like also guided the way that I think about my business. So I asked him, I was like, what shampoo do you use? He said, suave. And I was like, problem number one. <laughs> so the second question that I asked him, I said, do you know who owns suave? He said, no. I was like, okay. And I said, when was the last time suave communicated with you? He's like, hmm, never, <laughs> right? And I, I think about like a lot of the stuff that we do, right? Like you, know, you travel and don't want to go to TSA, like we'll ship blades to your destination for free. If it's your first time ever shaving, we'll do video one-on-one -on -one chats with you completely free, right? Like we do all these crazy things that do not scale truly to our kind of own customer benefit. Is that tech? If you kind of took away all the health and beauty stuff, I think so. Uh, not only that, I think a lot of folks think about kind of the context of the company where it is right now, right? We have a 150-year plan for, for this company, uh, leveraging technology in continued innovative ways, right? So our communication with those customers, our messaging to those customers, right? If folks come to our website from Palo Alto, they probably should be seeing something different from folks who come from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. The tone of voice should probably be different, right? We should be empathetic to kind of that locale, their needs, among other things, right? So this goes to some of that empathy. You know, I think even about the products that we make, right? Uh, you know, we're in an industry that's $500 billion built completely on the shoulders of subjectivity, right? Why is, why is it the fact that not everyone's unique physiological makeup is respected. Why is it the fact that my son has to use the same baby lotion as everyone else, right? When he has eczema, allergies, et cetera, right? Why is it the fact that like my wife has to use the same hair care products as anyone else? She, there's nothing more unique on the planet than an individual's physiological makeup, but this is the last industry on the planet that has not respected it, right? You need technology to fix that problem. I can't see any other way to do it. So a lot of folks kind of look at our company as bevel. I don't know, we're not a shaving company. We're a family of brands building very ambitious things to solve really important problems for people. Um, but when I kind of think about our grandiose vision uh, for Walker & Company, I want everybody on the planet to experience a Walker & Company brand. I want that brand that they experience in that category to be the last brand they ever feel they have to use. And the reason they're gonna do that is because we're gonna show them that the products that, we are, that they're using uh, on themselves work, and we're gonna show them how much they work. Right? Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I wasn't that suave man. <laughs> yeah, me too. Uh, <laughs> Looking good, John. <laughs> uh, oh, I want to. This is meant to be interactive, and I hope you've been holding in your questions uh, because soon we'll have the chance to, to do questions um, in roughly five minutes, actually. And if you have a question, please line up in the far aisle to your right, all the way against the wall. Point over there. Okay? <laughs> and please remember to ask single one-part questions. <laughs> you all know what that is, okay? <laughs> single one-part questions. <laughs> Thank you. Okay? Because I know some of you don't. Okay. But it's America, so it may happen. Okay, last question from me, then. Okay. So...
I think that because you're a quasi-hybrid person, multi, you know that there are generally two types of thinkers out there. There are the linear thinkers, linear execution-oriented thinkers, can be convergent thinkers, and there are the non-linear, you know, Captain Jack, you know, you it's say like that with crazy. disgust. <laughs> I know, it's <laughs> difficult right now. But it, complex, creative, like where are they going with this? Divergent, two types of people. Which type of person does a CEO listen to the most? Listen to the most? Yeah, which, which, which is that, which population should the CEO of a high growth startup listen to the most? What do you think, Kat? Who do I listen to? You think I listen to nonlinear? Well, who said that? You said that? I think linear. You think I, I appreciate linear people? I do appreciate linear. All right, so I'll take the contrarian view. I think nonlinear. <laughs> um, okay, so um, particularly in the context of like the company, we want to build, if, if we are to build a kind of 150-year-old company, uh, for me to focus primarily on nonlinear versus linear thinking would be a failure, right? And I kind of say that uh, through this experience. I get a lot of like press interviews, and a lot of folks will ask me, you know, what's your five-year plan? That's always the hardest question for me to answer. Like, I, I always can answer the 150-year plan. I could always <laughs> answer the 12-month plan, but I could never answer the five-year okay. plan. And the reason is, the five-year plan is just a suite of like well-executed 12-month plans, <laughs> right? Uh, and like, you know, things change, businesses change, acts of God happen, right? Like, there's no way that kind of linear thinkers can think that far in advance, at least in my opinion. But you need those linear thinkers to guide your process, right? Guide your innovation. I'm an incredibly nonlinear person, right? Like, things come, I adapt, et cetera. Uh, you know, either to our company's benefit and to our demise. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> um, but I've been very blessed and fortunate to kind of um, surround myself with uh, both linear and nonlinear kind of thinkers, right? Uh, you know, at least when I think about my own management, I try and anchor our team so far towards the extremes uh, for the sake of innovation, knowing that we're never going to get there, but we're further right than center, right? Um, and I need kind of like a lot of those nonlinear thinkers to continue to support me in that stead, to push us further right than center. Um, but, you know, if I didn't have the linear thinkers there, then it'd just be straight chaos, right? Uh, and, you know, I reflect a lot on kind of my own personal leadership and what leader I've been as a kind of CEO of, of the company that I'm leading currently. And in my life, I've always been this like step function kind of guy, right? Like I want to kind of benefit humanity two, five, 10, 100 X, right? Um, and it's really hard to manage people that way, right? It really is, um, because you can't assume that everyone's the same. And there are a lot of really fantastic gradual thinkers, right? So over the past like six to 12 months, the one thing that has fundamentally changed my leadership, my personhood, among other things, um, I, I like to think, all right, well, if I can improve 1.2% like, every single week, for a year, a year later, I'm 2x better than I was the previous year. That's just the power of compounding, right? Uh, so the more gradual I am in my thinking, while still trying to kind of push our team to the extremes, uh, has served me quite well. But the only way I'm able to do that in a way that's sane is to surround myself with both. Both. And on the question of both, we have a question queued back there. Do we have a question? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Please say your name and then... Go for it. Hi, I'm Carlo. I'm the That's the boss. That is the boss. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the president of Inform. Thank you both for coming tonight. Um, what problem do you think needs solving right now for tech? If you could start another company that either of you would start, what would it be? You go first. Yeah, she the question. <laughs> <laughs> Ask both of you at the same time, so you should answer at the same time. <laughs> One, two, three. Uh, uh, what company needs to exist out there? Oh, wow. Well, uh, at least for me, I, I'm very curious how to intersect technology people with business people and design people because I think they live in three different worlds and there are so few people who freely can go across. And if there aren't more people that can go across and translate, then we're not going to see a lot of growth. 
So a company I've thought of is able to do that. Um, so I believe in that. Go ahead, Tris. Yeah. I asked um, the question. No, it's a great answer. Um, one thing I care a lot about um, is being able to debate in a way that's constructive. I, I think about a lot of what's been happening over the past year, particularly in politics, among other things. Like it's it's almost impossible for us to have kind of constructive conversations, right? Like folks are so far right, so far left, that there's no middle anymore, right? Uh, and therein lies the problem, right? So like, what is the forum that needs to be created where we can like debate things in a way that's respectful of each other, that's based on fact, <laughs> right? Uh, among other things, and it's. I think it is very doable, kind of like with technology, um, but like no one's trying to do it, per perhaps because they just don't want to touch politics, but I think it's absolutely necessary in order for us to affect any semblance of change, because if you're dealing too far in the extremes, nothing's ever going to happen. Uh, and it's my hope not only, um, you know, not only for this region, but just for America, that someone builds this, right? Uh, a forum for debate uh, that is incredibly constructive. Hi, my name's Nate. Um, what are some tools and, or frameworks that you like to use or that are your favorites to understand the needs of your user? Yeah, it's a great question. One of my favorite questions. Nice. Actually. Um, so I come from like the IDEO school of like kind of customer development. Um, so any single product that we make, um, you know, we need to make sure, first of all, we want to identify a problem need state, right? And fortunately, uh, for our community, having kind of um, the majority of our customer or our employee base be folks of color, et cetera, incredibly diverse, we can identify those needs ourselves, right? Because we want to solve our own problems. Uh, but solving our own problems is not enough. We need to see if uh, kind of these are problems that scale to a kind of more broad populace. Um, so the minute we kind of come up with these ideas, the first thing we do, we'll engage uh, kind of in pure customer development mode, right? So we'll go, you know, for instance, we launched this electric trimmer. Uh, we fundamentally believe to be one of the world's most advanced trimmers. Uh, and the first thing that we did, we didn't do any designs for it, anything. We went to barbershops, videotaped folks, interviewed them, understood the difference between what they said they needed and what they actually needed. And the one thing I kind of learned throughout that entire process for design and to really get to empathetic, like really truly empathetic design, uh, is to understand those latent needs. Right, like the difference between what people say and what they actually do, and it's so fascinating. Like we've never done a focus group, um, and like the reason that's so important, um, and I hate focus groups really for this reason. A lot of folks will say, like, "Yeah, I'll buy it. This is a great, great idea." And at the end of the focus group, if you say, "All right, are you willing to buy it?" They're like, eh, "No," <laughs> right? Um, but like throughout that whole process, you're really observing and understanding what they're saying and what they're doing. Uh, and that's where the true innovation happens. So everything starts with just go out and speak to people and observe them and videotape them and understand that difference. Next question, go ahead. Hi, my name is Serene, and Hi. I'm going to break the rules, sorry. Um, but I'm wondering if you could repeat your six values and also share how you identified them. Sure. Um, courage, inspiration, respect, judgment, wellness, and loyalty. Courage. <laughs> Inspiration, <laughs> respect, judgment, wellness, and loyalty. How did I identify them? That was the second part, right? Um, and these are my personal things that are important to me, right? When I think about kind of my prioritizing my own life, right? Like I think about three things. Number one, faith, family, work, in that order. Like those are the things that are kind of most important to me, and a lot of my own personal values are guided by my faith, right? Uh, and I think in particular, courage is always the first one, uh, and I do that very deliberately. Um, and there's this like, beautiful quote that really speaks to it from Maya Angelou. Uh, she says, courage is the most important virtual virtue because without courage, you can't practice any other virtue consistently. Right? Um, and that's important, right? Uh, and it really helped guide the other things that kind of matter to me, uh, and that stick to itiveness, right? And that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm always right, <laughs> right? It just means that I have a kind of way of living that everyone else can expect, right? And if, if we disagree about what those virtues and values are, now we can have a discussion and a debate, right? But all too often, folks debate without really understanding the values on both sides of the table, and that's the problem. Yeah. We have one, two, three, four, five people with questions. That's it? One moment. <laughs> But I, 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 I know the way time works. Sometimes <laughs> someone at the end doesn't get to the ask their question, <laughs> and I hate that. So 
We're going to use an optimization I've invented. <laughs> so I'd like each of you to say your name, ask your question. I will take notes, and no more questions after that, so we can make sure we get them all answered. Is that okay? Okay, well, go ahead. Your name and your question? Hey, my, <clears throat> hey, my name is Paul Friedman. Um, <clears throat> with your, one thing that struck me about your um, talk is like this 150-year plan. Um, that's pretty bold long-term thinking. I was just wondering, like, there's specific um, things that can come up in that amount of time, some of which we know about, some of which we don't know about. Like, for example, ecological crisis. Mm -hmm. Do you plan for that, or do you just kind of figure <laughs> that you're going <laughs> to keep doing what you do and then let other people focus on that? Okay, Paul, thank you. Okay, hold, awesome. hold, hold, keep going. Next one. I can't wait right. to answer that question. My name's Gabrielle, <laughs> and awesome. my question was very, very similar. It was, what's the 150-year plan? Sure. Oh, 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 magic. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Gabrielle. Go ahead. Hey, um, my name's Mario, uh, longtime fan. Used to work at the Cape Forest Center, so oh, admired cool. your work through there and the marriage of business and impact. Um, I guess my question is, you talk about the values that go into your company and into the products you produce. Um, in your view, can the products also promote values, mm. um, particularly the values that you put into them, mm -hmm. or are products separate from, mm -hmm. from that or the function of them? Good one. Thank you. Next one. Hi, my name is Alexi Gregg. Um, my question is similar to Gabrielle and the previous gentleman. What's the point of the 150-year plan? Why? Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> why bother to make a company that lasts that long? Sure. Okay. Got it. Keep going. Hi, uh, my name is Abdul Lee, and my question is pretty similar, except <laughs> <laughs> um, in your 150-year plan, my understanding is that you have this view for the suite of Walker & Co. products. Um, how do you think about when is the right time to launch a specific product, and um, how to kind of organize or, or prioritize those different products, whether it's the bevel blade or the trimmer or whatever is going to come next? Mm -hmm. Okay. First, I want to applause for the people who stood up and asked questions, because you know, they wanted a, they want you to be here, and thank you for doing that. It's a great process. And I, I like apologize that. for doing it this way, but it's optimized. I'm a Tim Cook fan, or all that stuff. Okay, it's MBA. Um, so Paul's question: uh, the 150-year plan, bold idea, but what if stuff happens, like the planet goes away? Have you, yeah. Ha have you planned for that? Yeah, what are yeah, you going to yeah. do? Yeah. <laughs> um, look, I mean, I can't control what I can't control. You know, I have every faith in the world to know that, like, my faith will guide me through it. You know, some of the um, the, the best advice I actually got uh, was from a gentleman, Tyler Perry. Uh, he said, Tristan, you know, he realized his potential as an entrepreneur when he understood that the trials you go through and the blessings you receive are the exact same things, right? And one thing that's uniquely interesting about that is that those trials are just lessons, right? And those trials could be acts of God or otherwise. Uh, and the, the reason why it's so freeing for me is because we get this stuff all the time, right? Like things happen that a lot of our employees think might be the end of the world. I don't, right? You just got to adapt. You got to be flexible. And I don't know what I can do about the end of the world. Like it is what it is. Um, but at least we would have chased that opportunity uh, and hopefully build something that's, you know, 50 years <laughs> uh, old. Um, that said, like we, could, we can only kind of control the things that we can control. And for the things that we cannot, we just need to appreciate those trials when they come. That's a bumper sticker. End the world's coming. Chase the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to collapse space time with Gabrielle and Abdul. 150-year plan? Um, so you've got this idea of a suite of products in the future. How do you figure out how to time those products? How do you prioritize them in this 150-year span? Yeah, so I mean, so our, our ideal and goal is to solve kind of every single. Well, let me hold on. Let me back back. <laughs> well, no, why not? Uh, solve every single kind of acute health and beauty problem that folks of color face and everyone in, over index is on, right? If we don't do it, who else will? Right? Like, it doesn't necessarily mean that we'll solve everyone, but we'll damn sure try to, right? Um, so for as long as those needs happen, for as long as we practice empathy, as, for as long as we care about customers and humans, <laughs> right? Um, you know, it's a big reason why I started this company, because I fundamentally feel like I'm one of the best folks in the world to try this, right? I've been blessed with the opportunity to try it. 
Um, so why can't we dare to have the same ambition that the other folks that have that legacy have had? And I think what's very important to note is that whenever you take an inclusive design approach, you discover that you're solving problems that you didn't know existed. Mm -hmm. So even for people who are not of color, your products are having an impact in their lives. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, if, if I fundamentally believe that I want everyone on the planet to experience a Walker & Company brand, that'll take a long time. Mm. We're going to channel Alexi with, with a, a one more 150-year question because you've clearly made an impact with 150 <laughs> years. 150 years? So what's the point of a 150-year plan? Why bother? You didn't say that, of course, but I missed it of paraphrasing. <laughs> Why bother? Yeah, why not? Um, you know, the thing that's most interesting about that whole thing is like that everybody asked it as if it's like a taboo thing. Why does it have to be? Right? Like who questioned Procter and Gamble when they said the same thing? Or Johnson and Johnson or the founders of Unilever. You know, something interesting that like there's like Procter and Gamble, Johnson and Johnson, Unilever, and no one else. Okay, I wanna squeeze in this last <laughs> one before your last sixty second. Okay. Mario's last question, because you stood in that you stood in line. So th where's Mario? This is free. Mario? <laughs> He's right. This is for you. <laughs> um, so you're, you, you've connected values with your company and your products. Mm -hmm. Can your products promote values? 100%. They have to. Otherwise, you're being inconsistent in your own personal values, right? So even I think about our own electric trimmer. Uh, a lot of the features we didn't have to build, but we had the courage to dare to create the world's most advanced trimmer. We need to ensure that when folks touched it, they felt inspired by the design and that we cared. Uh, they needed to know that we respected their needs, right? The fact that you go to your barber shop and he's using the same electric trimmers on everyone else's hair on your face is disgusting, right? So we create features to repel any of those impurities, that sort of thing, right? Like we wanted to make sure that we were being loyal to those needs, among other things. So like those values don't only carry to the company, it carries in every single thing that we do, right? So if, if one were to come up with a brand or a product idea, it sure as hell better be courageous. It better be inspiring. It better respect the needs of our customers, right? Among other things, if that helps. Okay, this is the famous inforum tradition to ask all the speakers this question. Here it goes. Tristan Walker, what is your 60 second idea to change the world? All right. Um, so it's gonna sound a bit vague, but I'll, I'll kind of dig into it. Uh, it's to give us opportunity. And by us, I mean like, uh, you know, certainly me as like a man of color, at least in Silicon Valley, having n no awareness that this place was a thing. You know, Mitch Kapoor says something, uh, he probably, I don't know where this came from originally, and perhaps I'm embarrassed to not know this quote, but um, it's that genius is actually evenly distributed, but opportunity is not. That's a problem, right? Like there's genius in this culture. Right? There's like influence in this culture. Uh, and you know, if you look at kind of a lot of things that we're doing, we're impacting the world in immeasurable ways. When you take this greater cons greatest consumer demographic on the planet and make them the greatest producer demographic on the planet, who's dared to kind of ask what can result from that? Think about it. Like if you just kind of just take a few more steps <laughs> in answering that question, that to me is not only the greatest economic opportunity of my lifetime, but is the greatest thing that America can actually do for its people and the world in general. I think that captures the feeling. Let's first applause that feeling, come on. <laughs> and, and I think what's, I think what underlies it all, from what I've learned by watching Tristan and living life a little bit, is that I understand that part of that 60 second vision is gonna happen because you've attracted phenomenal people on your team. Very lucky, very lucky. And when I sit here with your proud Lord of the Rings fellowship people here, <laughs> they're there to fight for this mission. I know Cassidy Blackwell, <laughs> I, I, I mean, she was, she was recently in design.blog, thank She's you. She's a gift to us. Um, uh, the vision your team members bring, every time I see you showing up for team on Twitter, these are my team, this is my team. Everybody's like, I want that team. Um, <laughs> and I wanna acknowledge uh, a team that I worked with at Kleiner Perkins, uh, Aviv, Justin, and Jackie, who together with them, we did the design and tech report. They were my friendly young people who helped me <laughs> figure things out in a venture capital firm, which I had no idea what venture capital was yeah. when I joined. 
I'm serious about that. <laughs> and also to the global head of human resources, Lori McLeese over here at Automatic, <laughs> who has brought me into an amazing Willy Wonka factory, 50 country <laughs> global remote collaborative company to help to bring more inclusion and creativity into it. So teamwork is everything, yeah? It's, it's an amazing thing. And so I, I'm glad that you felt us teaming here on stage together. <laughs> I felt it was a true honor to get to do that with you and with all of you. And I just want to close with another big round of applause for Tristan Walker. Thank you, James.